Where we begin in this classwork is by adding fractions. All of the work in this first part is going to be dealing with fractions that already have a common denominator. So that's a lovely thing. It means we don't have to do a lot of work up front to make sure that the bottoms agree before we can combine them. Next week, we are going to have to do that work. And really, at the end of this classwork, we're going to get into how to do that work. But for now, all we have to remember is that when we add fractions, we keep the bottom the same. So here in A, when they both have a bottom of 8, the answer is going to have a bottom of 8. Then we combine what's on top. So what's on top in the first one is an x. We can combine that by adding it to a 3x. When we combine x and 3x, those are like terms. So this is an understood 1x. 1x plus 3x gives me a total of 4x. Almost all of these problems are designed to be able to be reduced once they get into their final form. So here, when I have 4x divided by 8, the way that I can reduce it is 4 can go into both things. On top, it's really like saying I have 4 times x. On bottom, it's like saying I have 4 times 2. So that 4 is the repeated factor that goes away and leaves me with my final answer of x over 2. Same idea in part b. I have the same bottom to begin, so I keep that same bottom, 9x, and I combine the two tops, 4y plus 2y. When I combine 4 and 2, since they are like terms, that gives me a total of 6y, still over that 9x. I can then reduce top and bottom by 3 here. So on top, it's really 3 times 2y. On bottom, it's really 3 times 3x. When I get rid of those 3s, I'm left with 2y over 3x. For part c, I'm going to keep the same bottom, 3x squared. On top, I'm going to combine x plus 2 plus 2x plus 7. The like terms here are the x and the 2x. When I combine x plus 2x, I get a total of 3x. The 2 and the 7 are like terms. When I combine 2 plus 7, I get a total of 9. I'm then dividing that still by 3x squared. This is a case where 3 can come out of both the top and bottom. I can't just reduce this 3x with this 3x squared, because this 3x is being added to 9. What I can do is see that on top, a 3 goes into both things. If I pull out that common factor of 3, 3x divided by it will leave me with x, and a positive 9 divided by 3 will leave me with plus 3. On bottom, if I pull out a 3, it's being multiplied by x squared. So that common factor of 3 can be reduced and leave me with x plus 3 divided by x squared. In part d, again, I'm going to start by writing the bottom x plus 5. Then I'm going to combine the top 2x minus 3 plus 4x plus 33. When I go to the next line over, I'm going to be combining like terms. This 2x and this 4x are like terms. They combine to give me 6x. This negative 3 and this positive 33 are like terms. They combine to give me positive 30. I still have x plus 5 on bottom. Now I can see that the top has a common factor of 6 that I can factor out. When I factor out that 6, 6x divided by 6 leaves me with x. 30 divided by 6 leaves me with a positive 5. So this is really like 6 times x plus 5 over x plus 5, or the same thing as 6, plus x, 6 times x plus 5 over 1 times x plus 5. If I then get rid of that common factor x plus 5, it leaves me with 6 over 1, or just 6 is my final answer. Problem 2 is the same exact setup as the first four parts of problem 1. The key difference is, here we were always doing addition, here we're doing subtraction. So, same general idea with one key difference. I still rewrite that same bottom, I still combine the two tops. The key difference is, I'm going to introduce parentheses to make sure that when I do this minus sign, I remember this minus sign has to apply to not only this positive 3x, but also to this negative 7. I want to make sure both signs get changed. So if I write inside here 3x minus 7, then in my next step I'm going to keep that 7x plus 1. I'm going to apply this negative to the 3x to get negative 3x. 
I'm going to apply this negative to a negative 7. Negative times a negative makes it into a positive 7. On bottom, I still have 3x plus 6. When I combine like terms, 7x minus 3x gives me 4x. 1 plus 7 gives me 8. So I have 4x plus 8 on top, 3x plus 6 on bottom. On top, 4 goes into both numbers, leaves behind an x plus 2. On bottom, 3 goes into both terms, also leaves behind an x plus 2. So I can get rid of that common factor x plus 2 and leave this as a final answer, 4 divided by 3. In problem 3, I have to do both addition and subtraction. That said, since all three bottoms are the same, all three common denominators, I can just write everything over the single common denominator, x minus 1. So the first thing I'm going to write is 4y. Then this is addition, so I'm just going to be adding in 2x. This is subtraction, so when I introduce a subtraction sign, I want to make sure the whole top of that equation is in parentheses. That way, when I go to get rid of the subtraction sign, I remember that it's applying to both terms. So not only does this negative apply to that y to make it a negative y, but this negative applies to that negative x to make it a positive x. Still over x minus 1. That means in my last line, I can combine my terms. 4y minus y gives me... 3y, positive 2x and positive 1x gives me positive 3x, and this is all over x minus 1. This can't really be reduced further. The only thing I might want to do is I might want to write it as instead 3x plus 3y over x minus 1, just because I'm used to seeing lower letters in the alphabet first, but really I think it should accept this answer if this was your answer. Um, Next stuff that we're going to do is all dealing with how to find common denominators if we need to find them in the future. When I'm asked to find the least common denominator of these pairs, what it's really asking me to do is find a way to make the bottoms the same by multiplying one or both of the two fractions. So what I'm looking for is I'm looking for how do I turn one of these two into the other? Or how do I find some common term that I can turn them both into? So I need to consider two things. I need to consider both the number and the variable. Before, when we were pulling out a common factor, what we would do is look for the lowest power of the variable. Here, when we're looking for the common denominator, we look for the highest power of the variable. So in this case, I see they both have an x in them. First power of x is the highest thing I see. So first power of x is going to be the common denominator. When I then look at the 9 and the 3, I can make a list of multiples. So if I was making a list for 3, it would go 3, 6, 9, 12, 15, 18, 21, 24, 27, 30. For 9, it would go 9, 18, 27, 36, 45, 54, 63, 72, 81, 90. I want to find where's the first number that overlaps and appears on both lists. The first number that appears on both lists is this 9. That's why the common denominator should be 9x. I can see that to get to that common denominator of 9x, I could take this fraction and multiply it by 3 over 3. That way 3x times 3 would give me 9x. This fraction, I wouldn't need to multiply by anything. So really, they're looking for what's the common denominator. They're not asking you to do out the math and combine them or anything. They just want to know what should go on bottom. So the answer to this question is just 9x. Same idea here. When I look for what the common denominator is, I'm going to start out by putting the highest power of x that I see, or in this case, the variable's a. So here I have a to the fifth, here I have a to the second. The highest that I see is a to the fifth. All that really means is I'm going to have to multiply this term by a to the third over a to the third. That way it will become a to the fifth. When I try and compare 16 and 24, if I were to do 16 out, 16 times 2 gives me 32. 16 times 3 gives me 48. 
16 times 4 gives me 64, and 16 times 5 gives me 80. For 24, 24 times 2 gives me 48, 24 times 3 gives me 72, 24 times 4 gives me 96, and 24 times 5 gives me 120. When I look at these lists, I see the biggest number that appears, or the, I should say the smallest number that appears on both lists is this 48. So that's why my answer is going to be 48, 8, and 5th. Again, that's what they're really looking for. What would go on bottom if you were finding this common denominator? When I have factors like this, it gets a little trickier. So if there's anything that can be factored, whether it's a difference of squares, whether it's a trinomial where I want to list out the factors, then I just need to count each factor once and I want to see if there's a repeated factor. In this case, c and c plus 2 cannot be factored any further. That means the common denominator must be these two multiplied by each other, c times c plus 2. So this is what you would write, c parentheses c plus 2 is the correct answer for the common denominator here. When I look at d, this is a case where, again, I have factors here that I can't think about in the same terms as these monomials above, but what I can think about is, can either of these two parts be factored? The first one can, it's a difference of squares. x squared minus 36 can be factored as two parentheses. First thing being squared is the x. To get to 36, I'm doing six squared. One's positive, one's negative. When I then go to list all the terms that are being, or I'm sorry, all the factors that are being multiplied, I have an x plus 6 here, I have an x plus 6 here, I don't need to repeat it twice. I only need to list it once in my greatest common denominator. I also have an x minus 6 that needs to be listed. So basically, if I were to go to create this common denominator, this would already have an x plus 6 and an x minus 6, so I could leave it as is. This would only have the x plus 6, so I'd have to multiply the whole top and the whole bottom to x minus 6. That way, these would have the same bottom, x plus 6 times x minus 6. So again, what I would write as an answer to the question in Cengage is x plus 6, x minus 6. That is the common denominator for this problem. In problem five, we're going one step further and basically saying, how do I make this original fraction into a fraction that has the common denominator indicated. So we have a fraction that starts out as 10 over x. We want the new common denominator to be x cubed. So the question is, what do I multiply 10 over x by in order to make it into something over x cubed? Always when we're multiplying, we need to multiply by something over itself. The reason we need to do that is because it's really multiplying by one then and not mathematically changing where we started. So if I want this bottom to go from x to x cubed, what I would have to multiply by is x squared. That way, x to the first times x to the second would be x to the 1 plus 2, and I'd wind up with x to the third. Always what you're multiplying by is the something over itself. So if I need to multiply the bottom by x squared to get where I want to go, that means the top also needs to be multiplied by x squared. If I multiply 10 times x squared, I wind up with 10x squared. I've now written an equivalent fraction, because all I've multiplied by is something over itself, to 10 over x. This equivalent fraction to 10 over x is now over x to the third, which was the denominator they indicated at the start I wanted to get as the bottom of my fraction. So this is the correct final answer you can see that if I wanted to reduce it using our exponent rules, x to the 2 minus 3 would become x to the negative 1, which would bring it back to the bottom and get us right back where we started. But we want to end here because now we have the proper common denominator where we could combine it with another term that had x to the third on bottom.